God's purposes for our difficulties. God's purposes for our difficulties. Oftentimes, when a lot lot of difficulties or problems come our way, suffering, hardships, the refrigerator goes out, (laughs) you don't have any money in the bank, huh? Family blow up, loss of a baby, an illness hits your family, things don't go away that should be going, bad things. Somebody else has hurt you. You've lost a job. When those things happen, too often we are anything but calm and trusting in God. And God wants us to trust him. He wants us to have faith in him and who he is and his ability to be able to come into our life and to be able to help us with these problems. And he wants us to have that faith. And according to our concept of God, our understanding of God, that's how we will live and that's how we will respond when these problems come into our life. Some people, if you have a view that God's a little God, you'll have a little faith. Uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a little reverence for God and a little resolving problems in a biblical way if you view him as a little God. If you view him as a limited God, uh, you won't go to him first because if you think he's limited, you're thinking he can't help you with all your problems. And so uh, you won't go to him first. But if you view him as a great God, You view him as the sovereign God. He's in control. He's a caring God. And he truly, biblically is the only great God there is. Amen? And it's only then that when you view him like a great God as he is, is, it's only then that you will totally trust him and put your faith in him when those problems arrive in your life. And I promise you they will come. Faith, trusting God, is allowing him to be who he wants to be or do in your life. It's just allowing him to do that. It's having faith that all things, whether they're good or bad, they're all a part of God's work and purpose for your life. Psalm 115 verse 3 says this here. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That shows you he's in control. He does whatever he wants to do, doesn't he? Ephesians 1, 9 and following. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? He's a sovereign God. He knows what's best for us. And he works things out to be able to fulfill his purpose in our life. Romans 9.20 says this here. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You see, a lot of people don't like to make him king or lord of life. They, don't, they want to control their own life. So they complain against God. And God said, Wait a minute. I'm the boss. I'm the one who made you. And I can do anything I want with you. You keep complaining, I'm going to you out (laughs) amen if I want to I can do that but we know that he loves us doesn't he it states this uh, in many places as you go the thought of it that if a believer doesn't comprehend or understand this truth when a difficulty arrives they will think of God as being small or limited And those people who are like that, they 
they respond with fear, with worry, anxiety. They wring their hands. What are we going to do? They begin to say things like, why is this happening? I'm a Christian. What are we going to do? Like God's dead? There's no use of even trying. How are we going to make it through this? Those are people who have a small, limited view of God. But if we know and trust that God is great, he's sovereign, he's caring, he's involved in our life as he says he is, we know that he uses these difficulties, these problems, these trials, even sinful attacks against us to help mature us. We understand that. And how does God do this? Well, he works in our problems, first of all, to direct us, to guide us. Proverbs 20, 30 says this here. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. We always use that with children. But also, God says in life, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Okay? Sometimes God, he makes us go through a painful experience in order to wake us up, in order to get our attention so we might look up to him. God uses our problems, our difficulties to light a fire under us so that we will stop being complacent, to make us uncomfortable, to get us to the point the only place we have to look to is up. To look up to him. C.S. Lewis said this, God speaks to us in our pleasure. He speaks. But he shouts to us in our pain. And that's true. When we're hurting, God has our attention. Then he's able to direct us. He said, hey, you're going down the wrong path. You're doing the wrong thing. Now, here's the right path you need to walk on. Remember old Jonah? He was going the wrong way. And so God sent a big storm with a big fish. Amen. And turned Jonah around until he was going in the right direction. Amen. The prodigal son, he was going down the wrong path, the wrong way, doing wrong. But God sent a famine and some pigs. And it states that, in that pain, he came to himself. So he works through our problems to guide us or direct us. Secondly, notice he works in our problems to inspect us. That means to check us out, to examine us, to test us. Now, he already knows how we're going to respond to a problem. But I think he wants us to know how we respond to a problem. Okay, I think that's important. And problems reveal what's inside of us. Problems squeeze out the real you. You've heard it before, <laughs> right? Believers, somebody said, are like tea bags. It's revealed what's inside when they're placed in hot water. Amen. And some of us are like tea bags. God allowed Satan to test Job, didn't he? And Job remained faithful and in faith, did he not? What, a, what an example Job was to us. It states Job 23, verse 10 and following. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And you think you're going through problems. You read about old Job and you'll begin to learn what real problems are. But in the midst of it, he remained faithful. Like still, people are stronger when they're tested. A man asked a silversmith, he says, how do you know when the silver is pure? And the man answered, when I can see my reflection in it. 
And we begin to realize he's a great God when we begin to, he begins to see the reflection of his son in our life. Amen? A ball team wanting to get better. They enjoy playing tough opponents because when they play tough opponents, then they can evaluate and see where they are and what they have to do to get better. Amen? Something else, number three. He works in our problems to correct us. Life is a school, and problems are part of the curriculum. Amen? That's just part of it. No life is absent of problems. David said this in Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. When God inflicted me, I got straight, didn't I? Then he says, in the next verse, he says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And then he says in verse 75, I know, Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. You see, problems, they teach us. They correct us. They educate us. And a lot of us in this room are highly educated. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We've had all kinds of problems that have come into our life. Our problems can be stumbling stones to make us fall, or they can be stepping stones to lift us higher in our relationship with God. And when our, the problems come in our life, God, he wants to take us from, why God? He wants to take us from our weaknesses, a stronghold, a wrong priority. He wants to take us from that to, God, I trust you. I love you. God, what are you trying to teach me through this problem? And I'm going to trust his purpose for my life, his provisions, his promises, his power. I'm going to trust that. Hebrews 2.11 says this here, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, you will make it through it. It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Amen? Not only that, number four, he works in our problems to protect us. 1 Peter 3.17 says this, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Amen? Your boss, he wants you to do something unethical, to be fraudulent in order to make some money. You're a Christian. You say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. He's upset with you. So he fires you after you pack your bag and you leave. You begin to think to yourself, I'm suffering, but I did what was right. And that's true. But that's not always the end of the story. Later on, your boss is arrested for embezzlement. And in reality, God was protecting you by getting you clear of what was coming down the pike for your life if you stayed there. He protects us. God uses a problem often as a disguise to protect us. Marshall College. An injury kept the player from playing in a game. He was really upset about it. But his injury also kept him from boarding the plane for game day. That plane upon returning with all of its football team and coaches went down in a blaze. Sometimes God disguises things in order to even to protect us. And I would believe with all my heart that all of us here, the only reason we're here is throughout our life, God protected us. Amen? Amen? Matter of fact, that young man spoke at Tennessee Temple. He was a black athlete, tremendous football player, but he had a leg injury. And it kept him from going, and he talks how his mama had prayed for him 
and so on. It's a tremendous, tremendous story. I think of Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. But while he was in Egypt, he didn't give in to temptation. He remained in faith to his God. And eventually, his problem, he became the second highest in power in Egypt. He saved his family, who eventually became the nation of Israel. And he was reunited with his brothers who had sold him into slavery. I wonder what kind of meeting that was. But here's what Joseph said, Genesis 50, verse 20. But as for you, he, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Even though evil was sent by my way through you, God used that in order to be able to, to make this a victorious day. And he can do that in your life. Number five, he works in our problems to mold us. Romans 8, 28, we quote it all the time. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But the next verse tells you why those things come into our life. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now get this, to be conformed, to the image of his son. The reason God permits, allows these things to come in our life, even though they are problems and they hurt, is to begin to use them to work in our life to make us more like Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, because of our Adamic, Adamic, however you say that, nature that we inherited from, from Adam, Started to say Satan. And I said, well, that's true. It went through Satan, Adam. <laughs> and there are a lot of rough edges we have when we get saved, and they need to be rubbed off. There's a lot of dull spots in our life that need to be polished up. Amen? I don't know about you, but that was me. <laughs> and so God began and began his work, and God's working in our lives to restore a godly image. Adam lost it. And when you get saved, God begins the process of sanctifying you, making you more like Jesus. And ultimately, one day, you will be like Jesus. He says in Galatians 4.19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, now get this, until Christ be formed in you. God uses his word to change our thinking about him. The reason people have a small view of God is they're not in the Word. Because when you read the Word, you have to step back and say, Whoo, what a God we have. Amen. Amen? You come to that conclusion. But also you learn about yourself. Because when you learn how great He is and you see yourself as you truly are, all you can say is, I am totally dependent upon Almighty God if I make it through this life. Amen? Amen? And that's just true. And in our problems, our heartbreaks, our situations, Hebrews 2.11 says this here. Did I give it to you? Endure that hardship, that difficulty. It'll be okay. Don't worry about it. Oh, there you are. For both he that sanctifieth God and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause... He, Christ and God, is not ashamed to call them brethren. And that's something. This great God, he looks at me as a brother. <laughs> Amen. Boy, that's, that's good. And today, problems are everywhere. And you might feel that problems just keep coming in your life. Sometimes you even feel that God must want you dead, but he just keeps missing you. <laughs> you, ever, you ever come to that point in your life? Huh? Someone said this, all sunshine and no rain makes a desert. Amen? And all good times, without any test, without any failures or problems, makes a believer immature 
and they will review and look at God as small or limited. You right now, you might be in some real problems. It's really tough. You're struggling. You're not sure if even you're, you're going to make it. Even this week. Huh? Remember a couple of verses. Psalm 118 verse 6 says this. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Glory to God. Amen. He says in chapter 56 verse 3. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Psalm 4 8 says this here. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thy Lord only makest me dwell in safety. Yeah. He's a great God, but he's a good God, people. He really is. I close with these three little simple things about God. God knows everything we're going through. We tend, we tend to forget, and we sort of say to her, God, I don't think you know about this. God, I, I don't think you know about my house payment. It's due in three days. God, I don't think you know that I'm... I'm desolate here, and it's so hard to find a, a job these days. God, I don't think you know my marriage stinks. God, I don't think you know that I'm about to go under, and soon. Let me just remind you and encourage you, God's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He knows when the next sparrow falls to the ground. Uh, and you're more important to him than the sparrow, regardless of what the animal rights people say. Okay? And then, secondly, God never wastes these problems, but uses them for our good. Now, the reason these problems come into our life, at times we bring problems on ourselves. The decisions we make, is it any wonder that there's, Results and consequences of those decisions. We bring them on ourselves and then we say, Oh God, where are you? You idiot, what did you make that decision for? We reap what we sow. At times, we're innocent bystanders. Life is not fair. And we live in a wicked, evil world out there, people. And things happen. Sometimes you don't want to go downtown in Indianapolis, do you? Huh? Not only that, at times, our genetics we've inherited from family genes pull us down. You know, that started, it started that sin begin to get in this gene to that gene to that gene. And there's a reason we have all kinds of physical problems. Okay? And then also, at times, it's a result of our fallenness. Do you understand we're sinful? And we're decaying. We're going to die. Huh? It's appointed unto man who wants to die, but after this, the judgment. All right? And it's just a fact of life. And then at times, we're demonically attacked. And the devil knows what your strengths are, what your fears are, your weaknesses, and he knows even your, you know, where you think you've got a handle on it. He knows how to get in there and tempt you to turn away from the things of God. And boy, he is good at that, is he not? Amen? But all these things here, God never wastes these problems. He uses them. And they're all under God's purpose and permission to be used in our life to develop us, to make us greater in faith, to give us some character in our lives. And even when we don't understand, understand this, he understands. He knows. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Even though we don't understand a lot of it that goes on, 
we know that our great God does understand. He's got a handle on it, and he's a lot greater than we are. Huh? Then also, the last point, number three, God always will be there for us. Regardless of where you are, he'll always be there. Psalm 139, verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Isn't that a great verse? Regardless of where I am, he's there to help me and to hold me up. And when everybody else walks out on you, I promise you, if you're staying faithful to God, and even when you're unfaithful, he will be there for you. Now, he can change the problem. But first of all, he wants to change us. Amen. If he just came in and just problem solved, we'd never learn. Huh? Huh? He wants to change us first. You talk about problems. Paul had a problem. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says this. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. He had some type of physical problem. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Then he says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. I prayed three times about this, that it might be depart from me. Take it away, God. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. In other words, God said, no. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am I strong. When I'm totally weak and I'm bombarded by all these problems that's come into my life, it's made me stronger than ever because I've had to depend on God in order to make it through. And when I depend on God, I get stronger and stronger. Have you ever been in a problem and thank God for the problem because you have been on your face asking God for help and for grace? And then you begin to realize and begin to sense the presence, the reality of the true great God. He was real to you at that moment and you didn't even want that moment to stop. You were willing to keep going through the problem. Amen? It happens. Paul, he had another little problem. One day he was stoned to death. That's a problem. You know that, don't you, huh? For preaching the gospel. They left him outside the city. All of his companions and friends and believers, they were all around. They all felt so sorry for, for, Saul, for Paul. Paul rose up alive. And the interesting thing is when he was out and everybody was feeling sorry for him, he was enjoying the presence of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one, now get this, caught up to the third heaven. Verse 4, that how that he was caught up into paradise. And heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. While you were all around there feeling sorry for me, I was visiting heaven. I had an experience. I, it's so wonderful, I can't even tell you about it. That's why I have problems with people who say they've been to heaven back and they tell you all about heaven. Paul said, it's unspeakable. Huh? That was a problem. Now, Carol and I, we were 24 years of age. I can't remember that. Where am I today? Matter of fact, where? Who am I? I wander a lot today. 
Oh, to be 24 again, amen? No, I don't want to go back there. But we rented a house on Comer Avenue down by Garfield Park City. And we had a problem. Our house caught on fire. I had gone to pick up the kids from the babysitter. Carol was at work and she was on her way home. I came back to my house and my house was just blazing. Firemen were there, everything in the front room and everything. I mean, we, we lost most everything. I remember, I'll never forget it, in my front yard was my bowling ball. And that thing was about that tall. It had just melted down. It was awful. But we lost about everything in that fire. As a result of that, we wanted to go somewhere for our kids. Where could we go to a nice place for our kids? And we moved down here to New Whiteland. And I look back on that. If no fire, no problem. If no problem, no New Whiteland. If no New Whiteland, no Grace Point. Because that's the way the Lord worked. And I look back, I say, God, who is sovereign, has purpose and a plan. And he used many of our difficulties to get us to the place he wanted us to be, but it, to get us to a place that would bring him honor and glory. My God is neither small nor limited. He is a great God. And he deserves my all. And if he deserves anything, he deserves my faith in him. So that when the problems come, I don't come apart. Don't like the problems. Who does? But I say, okay, God, this is what's going on. I give it to you, and I'm going to trust you through this problem. And when you begin to do that, something clicks in your life. He becomes not only the great God, but he becomes real to you. Because he loves to see his people trust in him, believing in him, regardless of what they're going through. His purposes in our difficulties. Father, we love you. We're thankful for each one of these problems that comes into our life because we know nothing does unless you permit it. And that means that there's purpose, there's a reason. And God, I just pray we pass the test. I pray that after some time we could step back and evaluate our life and we could say we were faithful, we stayed in faith, not because of who we are, but because we believed in who you are. You're the great God. You're the one with all the ability, all the strength, all the mercy, all the grace, all the love that's necessary for our lives. And without that, we are nothing. So God, I just pray that those that are going through some problems today in their life, that we just said something that would encourage them. Stay in the faith. Keep it up. Don't be ashamed. And God, I believe with all my heart, if they do that, you'll honor them in a special way and you'll begin to make them something special for your glory. In your name we pray. And everybody said?